Good evening, everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us tonight. I'm Liz Joyner, founder and CEO of The Village Square, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Constitutional Amendments 101. This is our first program of our 14th season that we're calling, for obvious reasons, the year of living digitally. Not only because we have to go digital until we can meet in person again, but also because we'll be taking on and talking about some of the digital forces that are impacting the health of our democracy. Uh, tonight's program is being recorded. The video will be available on our Facebook page and the audio will be released on our podcast, Village Squarecast. Uh, next Thursday evening, October 8th, we want to invite you to join us for COVID in Tallahassee with President and CEO of Tallahassee Memorial, Marco Bryant. And we'd also like to invite you to join us for God Squad for the launch of their 11th season uh, on Friday, October 23rd at noon and the program is called Our Broken Hearts. It's gonna be a full hour that they spend not talking about politics intentionally and just being human together. Uh, so tonight we're very delighted to have a panel of experts to share the pros and the cons of each of the amendments. Um, I'd like to thank Florida Tax Watch and League of Women Voters. Uh, they, we actually have a very long history of co-sponsoring this program together and I thought that I would share with you um, a uh, video, I mean, excuse me, a poster that we have of uh, when we had 11 amendments on the ballot. And you can see there Florida Tax Watch and the League of Women Voters of Tallahassee. And if you can see that picture, that was your face if you, um, when you see your ballot, if you don't go to Constitutional Amendments 101. So we thought you'd enjoy that blast from the past. Um, luckily, we only have six this time. Um, in case you're wanting to watch the presidential debate, I wanted to reassure you that we will have you out of here by uh, 8.30 at the very latest. Think of this as kind of a pregame. Um, you can ask questions um, of our panel by clicking on the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you can take a look at that now and be sure, not, you just need, you need to type it and then you need to send the Q&A. Um, and we'll be receiving it on the other end and sharing it with um, our facilitator tonight. Uh, and feel free to start um, uh, submitting questions right away whenever you think of them. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator, Dr. Carol Weissert. Carol is the Leroy Collins Eminent Scholar and Professor of Political Science at Florida State University. She also serves as Director of the Leroy Collins Institute, a statewide policy organization located at FSU that studies and promotes creative solutions to challenges facing Florida and the nation. Uh, we regularly turn to Carol as a facilitator when the policy gets complex and she helps us wade um, our way through it. Uh, you'll notice that on the panel when Carol makes the introductions that there is a relative of Carol's on the panel, her son Robert. Uh, and I am offering the disclaimer officially for both of them that uh, neither one of them had anything to do with this. It was my idea. Um, and I begged them individually because I knew they would be the right combination on this panel and they relented to my pressure campaign. Um, I've had lots of uh, conversations with the Weissert family and they have this wonderful way about talking politics with um, vehemence and disagreement and respect and love. Uh, so, so that's what we wanted this conversation tonight to look like and that's why we invited both of them. I will gladly now turn it over to Carol. Uh, thank you so much, Liz, and thanks all of you for, uh, for coming tonight on this important night. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about the six constitutional amendments that are on the November 3rd ballot. Four are initiatives, and two were put on the ballot by the legislature. These amendments are at the bottom of the ballot, uh, past the uh, members of Congress, the state reps, the county commissioners, the circuit court judges, even the special district board members are at the very bottom. And many voters simply don't vote on these amendments because they read them and they don't understand them because there's no partisan cue. They don't know how to, how to judge this. So it's really, um, it really flies in the face, this difficulty flies in the face that these amendments are really important. They will be in our state constitution from now on. The only way to take them out is another constitutional amendment to get 60% of the vote. So these are very important. So tonight we're going to discuss these amendments and provide information on them so you will be able to make an informed decision. I'd like to now introduce our terrific panel of experts and I'll do it uh, in alphabetical order. Dr. Frank Alcott, 
is a, the Director of Academic Initiatives and Special Projects and a Professor of Political Science and Environmental Studies at New College of, of Florida. He has been at New College since 2003. He teaches courses on world politics, international law, and environmental policy. Um, he is, uh, like most of the members of this panel, an, accompl an accomplished presenter um, for the news media, for panels across the state, et cetera. One of the things I really want to point out, though, that makes Frank special, at least among political scientists, is that he not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk. He was a, a candidate for Florida State Senate in 2016. So unlike the rest of us who just stay on the sidelines and cheer or complain, uh, Frank is actually out there as a political scientist, and I think that's quite terrific. The next um, person I want to introduce is Patty uh, Brigham. She is president of the League of Women Flo Voters of Florida. If you have been here in any period of time, you know that the League is, fights the good fight all the time. Um, and they are uh, responsible for such wonderful things, in my view, such as Fair Districts Florida, which is, a, um, which is looked at across the country as a way to, uh, to deal with redistricting. She uh, has been president of the League of the Women Voters of Florida since 2018. She was active in the uh, gun safety action um, part of the league, really got the league involved in that area and, and helped form a Florida coalition to prevent gun violence. She uh, started out as a radio uh, uh, reporter and freelance reporter. So she also has a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of uh, reporting and experience uh, presenting. The next person I want to introduce is Dr. Adrian Moore. He's vice president of policy of the Reason Foundation which is a nonprofit think tank advancing free minds and free markets. So um, um, Dr. Moore leads the reasons policy implementation efforts and conducts his own research on topics such as privatization, government and regulatory reform, air quality, transportation, urban growth, prisons, and utilities. So he covers quite a large area, although transportation is one of the important areas in government efficiency as well. I have to say that he was awarded one of the best prizes I've ever heard of. He was awarded the World, Outstand Out World Outsourcing Achievement Award. Now that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, he also does uh, a lot of presenting and we look forward to hearing his views. And last, we have Robert Weissert, who um, has been with the Florida Tax Watch since for 13 years, hard to believe. And he started out as a research analyst and worked his way up to a terrific title, Executive Vice President and Counsel to the President and CEO. So uh, Robert also spent some time in Washington working for, uh, as a staffer for the US Senate and also for Congressional uh, Research Service. And Robert is also a proud member of the Village Square Board of Directors. So um, with that introduction, I think what we will do is we will, um, we're going to spend most of our time tonight in a deep dive on three of the most salient amendments. However, we also are going to talk to you and go briefly about the other amendments. So what I'm going to do is show you the amendment language. Good if I could. Um, I'm able to do this. Let me see. There we go. Um, the, um, I'd like to just briefly go over, these are the first two amendments are of the ones that were put on the, the, in, on the ballot by the state legislature. They are Amendment 5 and Amendment 6. Again, I think it's important just to let you know that they are there, and if anybody has any questions about them, our panel will be happy to discuss this. Uh, amendment 5, is, it expands the, the number of years that you can pr provide. What? Um, the number of years that you can um, uh, that you can obtain your um, uh, uh, your uh, save our homes benefits. Right now, the situation is sometimes it's it's two years, but if you buy your house at the end of the year, you don't get the for full two years. So um, that is uh, that's that was something put on by the uh, the legislature, and then Amendment Six basically um, is a little more complicated, but it expands the uh, a, a homestead property tax, um, uh, I'm sorry, something's going on here, a property tax uh, discount to not only um, uh, veterans with permanent combat related disabilities, but also the spouses of certain deceased veterans. So these are two important amendments, albeit amendments that don't 
um, that don't, um, uh, that aren't as controversial. Sorry, it's not moving forward. Um, that one, the last one that um, I want to uh, mention is Amendment 1. Um, and Amendment 1 is um, one that we might want to, the panel might want to mention. Amendment 1, the first one that, you, that you're going to get when you, um, when you go to the, the poll, um, is a citizenship requirement. The current language in the Florida, the Florida Constitution is every citizen of the United States who is at least 18 years of age and a permanent resident of the state, if registered as provided by law, shall be an elector of the county where registered. The provision would change that to only a citizen of the United States who is at least 18 years of age and is a permanent resident of the state um, will get to vote. So this is one that would, the legislature did not put on the ballot. It was put on the ballot by, um, by uh, another group. Um, and so it is a, a, a little bit of a strange, um, of a strange uh, 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 ballot measure. Why are, we, why are we changing? Why is it we have a, why do we have an amendment that really basically only changes two words? So then I'd like to, to turn it over to the panel. Um, so these are the three sort of, I'd say, non-controversial um, non uh, amendments. What, what does the panel think? Why, why, is, why is Amendment 1 there and what does it do? Uh, well, I'll take that. Uh, I would say that's an excellent question. What, why is it on there? It seems like some semantical game playing there because everybody knows that you already have to be a U.S. citizen to vote. So the purposes of the amendment aren't completely clear what the sponsor's intent is here. I just might uh, add a little bit. I was confused that uh, it looks to me like this is irrelevant. And why would a nothing burger um, uh, be number one amendment uh, on, our, on our ballot this uh, year? Did a little bit uh, uh, of digging. Um, this is not uh, unique to, uh, to Florida. And so the person that uh, at least is nominally up front in putting this has done this in some other states. Um, however, um, I, I, uh, I was drawn as I was looking around to why, why would you actually make an unnecessary change? Um, some work, uh, uh, some journalism on the part of the Tampa Bay uh, Times, which anybody could uh, uh, look up. If you follow the money, um, uh, there was an obscene amount of, of, of signatures, more than double that was needed uh, to be collected, uh, that were dumped um, in a number of county supervisors of elections offices right around the time that they actually had to certify another amendment uh, that the energy industry was very, uh, they didn't want to see uh, uh, pass. Um, that amendment ultimately got kicked off, not through an inability to get the supervisors of elections to certify it, but rather the Supreme Court uh, because it was a confusing uh, amendment. Um, but if you follow the money, uh, this nothing burger uh, might have been put on uh, uh, by um, big energy interests uh, in order to knock another amendment off that's not on the ballot. So what should, uh, should people do? Does it really matter? Does it make a difference? If we change every citizen to only a citizen? I don't think legally it, it makes any difference because the language as it reads right now says that citizens are allowed to vote. And the way that is legally interpreted is no one else is given permission to vote because the language clearly states citizens are allowed to vote. So the only reason to change the language and what the proponents basically argue is that the constitution needs to say who can't vote. And so they want it to say only a citizen, so it makes clear, uh, clearer in their minds that non-citizens cannot vote, even though right now non-citizens clearly can't vote. So I do want to <laughs> jump in with a clarification. I agree with everything Adrian says, and and Tax Watch has not uh, encouraged or, or uh, recommended that people vote for this. We've called this solution in search of a problem. But there are states, not Florida, but there are states where non-citizen residents are allowed to vote in local elections. Uh, currently, no state in the country, no, none of the 50 allow non-citizens to vote in statewide elections, but Massachusetts, Maryland, San Francisco, and California do allow non-citizens to vote 
in local elections. Not a single city or county in Florida allows that. Current Florida law does not allow non-citizens to vote. This will have no legal impact on that. The Constitution currently prohibits it. It will prohibit it if it passes. But uh, I do want to clarify that it is not uh, a given that everywhere in the country non-citizens can't vote. That is actually factually not true. Are we the only state that's considering it, this uh, particular amendment this year? No, as Frank said, it's on the ballot in two other states as well, Alabama and Colorado, for those keeping score at home. So this nothing burger, as, uh, as uh, Professor Alcock said, is, uh, is not only in our, our, our state, but other states. I think it's useful to, um, to, you know, to point this out, just because it is, you know, people look at this and they go, I don't understand this. It sounds, it sounds like it does, it's not going to make much difference to Florida. It's not. It will make no difference in this state. It will make no legal, have no legal impact. I do want to add on amendments five and six, though. Um, those were put on the, by the legislature. They are non-controversial amendments. There's no organized opposition to them. They're pretty small. In fact, number six has a, a fiscal impact of less than $2 million a year. Uh, they are on there because they are technical changes to things that are already in the Constitution, the Save Our Homes provision and the already existing uh, disabled military service veterans provision, uh, but the legislature has to change the constitution to make these amendments. I think that'll come up later as we talk about the importance of what we put in the constitution, because once something's in the constitution, like both of those property tax amendments are, uh, the only way to make even a very minor clarification, which is what five and six both are, is to amend the constitution again. And this is where we get into the cycle of we put one thing in the Constitution, if you want to tweak it, you got to do another one, you got to do another one, you got to do another one, as opposed to something that's done by the legislature where they can simply come back in a future year and make a tweak like Amendment 5, which was intended to be a two year uh, window to use your homestead exemption. But as you mentioned in your introduction, if you sell your home anytime after January 1, the clock for that two years goes back to January 1. So if you sell in December, you could have only 13 months instead of the originally envisioned two years. Uh, so I do think it's important to point out that while those two are very minor, uh, they are corrections the legislature felt was necessary. The legislature passed them both overwhelmingly in both houses uh, of the legislature and they have to be done by constitutional amendment. Would you have and I'd like to add that uh, the League of Women Voters of Florida actually opposes those two amendments strictly because we don't believe that issues of taxation should be going into our state constitution. But there's no other way around it. They have to be done through the constitution. Now, we would agree with you, Save Our Homes should not have been in the constitution. In fact, we were opposed to it when it was originally put up. But now that it is, the only way to make this, this tweak is to change the constitution. So in theory, I would agree with you, it shouldn't have been in the constitution in the first place. But now that it is, we're stuck in the world that we are, and this is the only way to make a tweak that really does make an unfair system that never should have been in the Constitution slightly more fair. What are they? Yeah, that's, are that's, they? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that that's how I think of five and six also is, you know, this should never should be a constitutional matter, but it is because they put it in the Constitution when they created the program. And uh, Floridians have generally embraced the uh, a taxation system that leans more towards taxing visitors and away from taxing property owners in the state. And they voted for measures that had very clear intent that weren't quite realized by the language. And this language delivers on what Florida voters really wanted in previous votes. So it makes sense. I mean, I, I think it may, they both make sense just because of that. Well, and I'll just quickly agree with my fellow uh, panelists. Um, uh, I don't understand why our property tax uh, laws are in the Constitution, uh, but I, uh, Adrian's right. If you want to make changes, uh, you, you have to go back in there. Um, substantively, I really don't have a problem. Uh, these are very, very minor in terms of their fiscal impact. Um, but I will raise just one uh, a concern and. Um, and Adrian, I think you, you hit on it. Um, uh, the Save Our Homes, while well, I benefit from it, and I appreciate that the, 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 the tax break, it has over time um, created some massive inequities in terms of t tax burdens. Uh, and so you, you, when you try to put in tax breaks, property tax breaks uh, for certain groups um, and, and not others, you're either going to shrink 
municipal revenues are they're, they're going to have to compensate by going after and raising taxes for people that are not protected. And so that that discrepancy, I think it bothers me a little bit. Um, these two changes are, are really not don't, don't affect that, but it's more of an ongoing thing in, in terms of how we do property tax law in the state of Florida. Good. So let's move on to the uh, controversial amendments, or the ones, the more salient ones anyway, the ones where we have more disagreement. Um, amendment two uh, raises Florida's minimum wage. Um, it would raise minimum wage to $10 per hour effective September 30th, 2021. Each September 30th thereafter, a minimum wage shall increase by a dollar an hour until the minimum wage reaches $15 per hour on September the 30th, 2026. From the point forward future, uh, wage increases shall revert to being adjusted annually for inflation starting September 30th, 2027. So, um, Mrs. Brigham, do you want to, uh, you were, the league is in favor of this one. Why is the league in favor of it? This is the only uh, initiative this year that the league is in favor of. Well, first of all, nearly 75, or excuse me, nearly 70% of Americans polled by uh, the P Research uh, Institute last year favor a $15 an hour minimum wage. And this has long been overdue. I mean, Florida's legislature has not only refused to adjust the statewide minimum wage themselves, but they actually passed a law preventing that local governments uh, from setting their own minimum wages. And of course, the, the league is a strong believer in home rule, and, and that certainly goes against that. And Florida's uh, present minimum wage yields only $17,800 a year for a full-time worker. How can you possibly not just support yourself on that amount, but a family on that amount? You would have to work multiple jobs to be able to feed your family and pay your rent and uh, the fact that our legislature has not really addressed this and that it has been um, left to the citizens to do it is uh, quite unsettling, but we are happy to see this initiative on the ballot. There's always, there, there's, there is now a constitutional amendment, um, a, a provision in the constitution related to minimum wage, right? It's, and it, it's very, it's much lower than this, even mm -hmm. though it is indexed. Um, Professor Alcock, do you, you support this amendment? I, I do. Um, uh, so let me try to explain why quickly. Um, I think that there's going to be a substantial impact on low income workers and some fam struggling families. And I don't, I think that's clear and it's not contested. And so the numbers are pretty compelling about who's going to benefit from this. I think, what are we concerned about? Uh, what are the risks here? I think uh, we should be concerned about a negative impact on employment. Um, if uh, we're going to lose jobs because of this uh, uh, amendment or this change, that's certainly uh, debatable. Um, there's uh, concerns about uh, small businesses, particularly in an era of COVID. Is this going to actually uh, cause some uh, small businesses to close down? And there's also, uh, will it lead to an increase in prices and, and how much and who's, gonna, who's that going to hurt? I think there's numerous studies uh, out there and it's going to be very confusing. Uh, uh, for people, and I'll just point out a couple of things. There's three types of studies that I think that are important. Uh, one type is actual empirical work, which is analyses on what has actually happened in other places when you raise uh, the uh, minimum wage. A second type of uh, um, analysis is actual projections um, uh, that are usually based upon models that are based upon what has actually happened in other places. Um, there's a CBO study, Congressional Budget Office, which I think is the closest thing to a referee that has done something nationwide. And I, I, I wouldn't, I think some of the other panelists might refer uh, to that study, but that's projection, not necessarily analysis on what's happened in the past. And then there's a lot of surveys floating around where they're asking businesses or other folks, you know, what are you gonna do um, if, if this comes? And they'll, they'll actually give you their, um, you know, their, their judgment about what they might uh, do. I, I think uh, as somebody that has a little bit of background in e economics, um, how do you navigate, you know, the landscape? My judgment has been that um, the majority of the work that's been done on actual empirical studies of, of minimum wage uh, shows that there's modest to negligible impacts on employment with a couple of important caveats. One, uh, it's not all clustered. There's a good amount of variation. You have a lot of studies that say not much at all happens in terms of due employment with a few outliers and contacts matters where you're looking at, if you're looking at uh, the, the country as a whole, if you're looking at certain sectors, if you're looking at certain uh, 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 states, you certainly can have um, impacts that are a little different in one context than another. 
one thing that I do think is important, though, um, is um, there's a recent work that I found compelling uh, that rather than look at the country nationwide and try to extrapolate down to a state or look at a state, uh, there, there's been some work that looks at actual counties that focuses on um, where you have low, where there's the, the differential between um, the minimum wage and the median wage is rather close, it means there's a lot of people working there, and then that a minimum wage increase will affect a lot of businesses. And these are areas where the positive impact, uh, we can expect some, and there's also a lot of risk there. What does the empirical work show? It shows that there's some really, really substantial positive impacts for families on the margin, and the employment impacts are not as bad as we think. So my own judgment uh, on some of these issues, there's a lot to gain here. There are risks that we need to consider, uh, but those risks, I think, are, are overblown uh, on the part of the critics. All right, so now we're here from the con side. Dr. Moore, Mr. Weisert. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, Frank Frank actually nailed it with the uh, the nature of the studies. I am an economist, so uh, the, these these things have been sort of bread and butter for many many years, and that's exactly the right characterization. Um, I would add and modify that summary though by saying, first of all, that the uh, the effects on employment um, have have grown over time. So a lot of studies are from you know five ten years ago. Because of technological changes, it's, you're, it's possible now to replace uh, 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 the cashier at a McDonald's with a kiosk in a way that it wasn't even just a few years ago. Um, and the other thing is, is that while a lot of this research finds that it doesn't shrink the economy, so the total jobs in the state don't go down, the economy continues to go along, what it does is it changes the distribution of who benefits. It's not that people don't benefit, it's just the people that benefit are not the people who right now are making minimum wage. Because when an employer can, has to pay $15 for the lowest skilled employee rather than $8, they're going to want a different employee for that 75% wage hike. They want someone who's older and has more experience. And so, what you get when you raise the minimum wage like this is young unskilled people get replaced by older low skilled people, but who have held jobs have shown some level of reliability and are worth a 75% higher wage uh, more than an inexperienced brand new worker. So in place after place where these large minimum wage hikes have gone in, what you see is a big change in the amount of technology used instead of workers. Total employment doesn't go down, but the entry level jobs shrink and the people who get those entry level jobs uh, become not your teenagers and your sort of traditional minimum wage workers. So because people are not supporting a family on minimum wage, by the time you're at the age where you're starting a family, you've usually been working a few years, hopefully, and one way you're not making minimum wage is by being a good worker for several years and getting several raises. And now you're making 10, 11, $12 an hour. And maybe both of you are working or you rent an apartment with a roommate. You're not really trying to uh, support an entire household on a minimum wage. That is only a small percentage of minimum wage workers. Most people are trying to make some money on a minimum wage and get the experience they need to move up in pay. So you're against this amendment? The, uh, yeah, the uh, raising the minimum wage would, uh, would all the people who are currently making minimum wage would be uh, severely hurt by it. <laughs> Mr. Weissert. Yes, thank you. I, I would, uh, would, would again say that there's a lot of data out there and, and TaxWatch has done a report, uh, 22 pages, looking at some of that economic data and, and doing our own um, with a group called the uh, Regional Economic Consulting Group, which is some former state economists that have looked at the specific impact here. And um, they've said that it's going to be more than $7 billion it will cost the Florida economy by the time it's fully implemented. So uh, I think there are some economic issues that, that do need to be discussed. One is the, the total cost. We're talking about billions of dollars to raise those wages. Two is that there's a lot of talk about food service employees, about a million and a half uh, food service and retail employees that would be directly affected by this. But there's a lot of other sectors, uh, as Adrian said, not necessarily when you're talking about 
uh, Florida's current minimum wage of 856, but as you start raising over the 10, 11, $12 threshold three and four years down the road with this constitutional amendment, that's where you start getting into a lot of things like administrative services, educational services, transportation services, and start raising those costs. And that's where it really starts uh, moving through the economy. That's where everything that you buy from food to uh, anything that you order, anything that you consume, uh, the costs of those are really going to increase. Um, Florida does already have a higher minimum wage than the federal. The federal is $7.25. The Florida's minimum wage is 856. Uh, you referenced in the intro that the constitutional amendment was in 2004, where we raised the minimum wage and higher to inflation. So every year on January 1, the minimum wage goes up. On January 1 of 2020, it went up from 846 to 856. That's already in the constitution. Uh, this would, as you mentioned, change that date. This is really minor for it, but. It would change the date of that CPI adjustment from January 1 of every year to September 30th of every year, um, but it would it would increase by one dollar for the first five years. So those are those are some of the economic costs. There is a, a public cost to this as well. Um, the state economists have looked at this and said it'll cost about a half a billion dollars to the taxpayers in the first year. Uh, I'm sorry, in full implementation, about half a billion dollars because uh, of our state in 67 counties every single one of those 67 one of the largest employers is public employers in 61 counties including leon uh, the largest single employer in the county is public in 40 counties two of the top three largest employers are public and this minimum wage would apply to state and local employees wouldn't apply to federal that's a constitutional issue but um so there is a fiscal cost to to the taxpayers. And, and I think Adrian brought up a good point about living wage too. Um, if you look at $15 an hour compared to the actual living wage, uh, it would only really bring a living wage to people who are either single one income, no children, or dual income with only one child. So it's not, we don't want to conflate the issues of minimum wage and living wage. This wouldn't necessarily create a living wage, although I think many of the proponents do try to, um, to conflate those two points about living wage and minimum wage. This would raise the minimum wage, which would affect those entry level and some of the low, low uh, skill employees and would result in some job losses. I know Frank uh, mentioned the CBO study. I think it's a good one. And that does show that there would be some offsetting decreases in employment. That is, people would lose their jobs. And, and that's one of the policy arguments here is that there are winners and losers. There are some people who benefit from it because they get more wages for their current uh, position. And there are some people who lose from it either because they lose the buying power if they make more than $15 an hour, but not by much, they lose some of their buying power. There are some who will lose their job outright. And there are those on fixed income, especially seniors who now have higher costs, but no additional income. So there, there are some winners and losers here. And I think that's one of the major issues the biggest one is that this doesn't belong in the Constitution. There were seven bills in the 2020 legislature to raise the minimum wage to $15. This is exactly the kind of thing that the legislature should look at and should do ultimately if that's what the voters want. But when we put it in the Constitution, if we need to make any tweaks in the future, that's gonna be extremely difficult to do. So what we need is to have this same policy debate, which I think is a good one, but have it in the right place, which is the legislature, not in the Constitution. Well, I'd like to weigh in here on this. Uh, I, I respectfully I disagree. Uh, I do think that we have to be careful with what we put into the Constitution, absolutely. But when we have gridlock in our legislature for as long as we've had, and there's only one um, part of the population being addressed, that's a problem. And that's why we see these citizen initiatives going into onto the ballot. And I would argue that, um, and, and I'm sure there was no intent here, but it sounds like there's some dismissiveness about young single people and how much their uh, needs are. I mean, if you're a young person and you have to pay your rent or you have a roommate or you're a married couple and you're only each making minimum wage because you're right out of the gate and you are you may not have a college education, for example, we can't forget those uh, citizens 
we uh, can't create more hardship for them. It's extremely difficult to live on the living wage that you were talking about as it is. So it's, it, it's, it's sad that oftentimes when we're discussing uh, issues like this, that it boils down to all of the data, et cetera, the economics, when we need to look at this as a human issue as well. I, I agree on, on the human issue thing. I mean, that is very much what motivates people uh, around this question, uh, absolutely. But, but that's also like directly what is, I mean, the average small business owner is not making these decisions about what to pay based on a philosophy or something. It's, it's very, a very practical down to earth decision. If, if you're making the minimum wage, it's because at this point, you are very, very replaceable. Minimum wage means, you know, that, that there's lots and lots of people who can do that job. That's what keeps the wage minimum in a sense. Um, the way you get out of that is not just, I think a lot of people think there's sort of a story that you have to go out and get skills and get education. That is certainly one way to do it. But it's also very widespread in this country that it's hard work. You, if you're a good employee, you don't stay at minimum wage for very long because that does set you off from the other people who are willing to work for the minimum wage. So it's all about, for every minimum wage worker out there, it's about how do you make yourself different and more valuable to your employer than the other people who are lined up, you know, figuratively blocks to take that job because there are a lot of people in this country who can fill every minimum wage job. That's why they're minimum wage. Getting out of minimum wage is the whole secret. And you can do that just by being a good employee and sticking it out and showing value. And that's the path people have to take. If we raise it, it doesn't change that dynamic. It just means now 15 is the minimum. And as my local ice cream parlor owner told me, is right now, look around. I've got six high school kids working in here. When I have to pay $15 an hour, I guarantee you I'm gonna have six 25 year olds working in here because they're willing to work for 15. They aren't willing to work for 850 and they're much more reliable. They call in sick less. They don't change jobs every six months the way all these teenagers do. So there you go, those kids are out of a job and now new people are benefiting from it. So what Robert said, you get some people are going to win, but for every one of them, someone's going to lose. And, and well, I, wanna... I think we're making assumptions that, you know, all of these um, people making a minimum wage are, are teenagers when I don't believe that's the case. I mean, there are many uh, adults making minimum wages because they're working in professions that are not respected by Americans and they're not given a chance really to move up in their um, income level. And, you know, we're not addressing these issues in the state and we're not addressing these issues in the country. Well, Carol, just one really quick point, because I know you probably want to uh, move on. It's a counterpoint uh, just to, uh, uh, to Robert. I, I, I do think um, we, we have a history um, in, this, in this state um, when the legislature is um, ignoring um, important matters uh, uh, where the citizens of Florida are getting frustrated because they're not dealing with something that they should we have the citizens initiative uh, a route and so uh, if i were to ask or anybody to ask do you totally trust the legislature to get everything right that matters to the state of florida i don't think you're going to find too many people that give you a thumbs up on that one and i think this is an important one the legislature has had plenty of time to deal with this they failed uh, and that's why we have a ballot amendment well and that's why we have elections though if the legislature isn't doing their job then vote them out but, but we're going to get to that amendment in a second we're going to I do want to get to, to Patty's point because I do think it's a good one about the, the people, the people here. Um, I, I think this amendment is a good example of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Nobody doesn't want to help the people that are struggling to get by. My point in the data was that the minimum wage raising it doesn't actually raise the living wage. There's an old adage in public policy about uh, a train and removing the caboose that when they did a study that in train accidents, the people who were most likely to be injured or killed were in the caboose. So the solution was to remove the caboose. 
Well, that doesn't do anything because it simply makes the next to last car that used to be the next to last car now the last car. There's always going to be a last car. So what we say by trying to raise the minimum wage is we're trying to help these people, but what we're actually doing is then raising their costs and potentially putting them out of a job. So it's more complicated than just saying we want to help people because of course we want to help people. But this policy implication will do a lot of things to Florida's economy and will have some negative impacts on those same people that it's purportedly trying to help. I'm not saying it's a terrible idea. I'm not saying that the people who support it are bad. And I'm not saying that the people who don't make $15 an hour don't deserve our love, respect, and the potential assistance from government. I'm saying that this policy solution doesn't really solve the issue that it purports to solve. And that's the problem, Frank, with the constitutional amendments, because when you have sound bites, when you're doing public policy by bumper sticker, it really has a lot of unintended consequences. And this is the poster child for the unintended consequences. Carol, you're muted. You're muted. I think the host, and now you can hear me? Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, then that was the uncontroversial one. Uh, so we're going to move on to Amendment 3. This is all voters vote in primary elections for state legislature, governor, and cabinet. This would allow all registered voters to vote in primaries for state legislature, governor, and cabinet, regardless of political party affiliation. I'm sure our audience knows we have a closed primary in Florida. So you are not able to vote under, um, with most circumstances if you are an MPA. All candidates for an office, including party nominated candidates, appear on the same primary ballot. The two highest vote getters advance to the general election. If only two candidates qualify, no primary is held and the winner is determined by general election. Candidates party affiliation may appear on the ballot as provided by law, effective January 1, 2024. So on the pro side here, Mr. Weissert, you are pro this top two primary. Yes, uh, we are for a few reasons. The general concept is increased participation in elections. Um, as with Amendment 2, there is a lot of academic literature on the potential outcomes, whether it would create more centrism and less uh, polar politics if you had in strongly Republican areas, uh, two Republicans that had to, um, to cater to the entire electorate or two Democrats that had to cater to the entire electorate rather than the nearly one third of the legislature that's currently elected uh, at the primary only in a closed primary and then doesn't face any uh, opposition from the other party in the general election. But we can debate outcomes all we want, but the, the, the core issue here is that 3.7 million Floridians are registered with no party affiliation. They pay for primary elections and they're banned from voting. That's crazy. So we have nearly 4 million people who are paying for an election that they're not allowed to participate in, and all voters vote will solve that by allowing that everyone to participate in these elections. So more participation is better, and it's generally a positive thing. Uh, whatever the outcomes will be, this would be more fair for everyone to get to participate. So we have on this side, we have Dr. Moore and Ms. Bingham on the same side on this one. So why are you against it, Dr. Moore? Well, first of all, I, I, the one thing I would disagree with Robert on right off the bat is that uh, no one's banned from voting in the primaries. They're banned from voting on the selection of the candidate for a party which they are not registered. Um, parties are not government entities. They are private clubs that we formed as a culture um, to help us organize and make it easier for us to vote by kind of teaming up with people who think similarly so that we can work together to pick a candidate that represents our views, um, whatever party you're in. And if you're not in a party, that means you don't want to play in that sandbox. Specifically, that's what it means. So you could still vote in the primary for anything that isn't choosing a party's candidate. And then ultimately, when the parties decide who they want to run for them, you get to vote who, get, who, who represents you at all levels of government from whichever of those parties you choose. You are only excluded right now from helping parties of which you are not a member choose their candidate, which kind of makes sense. Nobody, I, I don't belong to the League of Women Voters. I don't get to choose their positions on ballot initiatives. But I don't, don't have any say it. in that. 
I, that's right. But you, you pay, pay for election. the election that you're not allowed to vote in. You are allowed to vote in the election. You're just not allowed to vote on that one square that has to do with a party you're not a member. You get to vote in all the rest, all the nonpartisan uh, uh, candidates that might be on that ballot or whatever else, local initiatives, what have you. Um, so the election, now we could get into a whole question about whether party choice pros voting processes should be paid for by the taxpayers. I mean, they no, could do okay. that privately yeah. and raise their own faith, but let's not go there. No. Um, I think the other thing about this too, I moved to Florida from California. California was first to adopt this approach. It did nothing in California to reduce the partisanship of any election in that state. Um, and so the outcome that is desired uh, by the proponents of making elections less partisan is not likely to happen. So this is really interfering with parties' ability to choose their candidates effectively. It's going to lead to all kinds of dirty political games where people who don't belong to a party will be organizing uh, on Facebook and what have you to go and try to mess up the other party's election by making sure they get the least electable candidate selected and all those kind of games. I don't know how much that will really go on, but it's we don't need more messiness in our elections <laughs> by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. And you, you mentioned in your, in your counter there the pro too, which is that you'll have more moderate candidates. That's the, that's the <laughs> idea, right? If, you, if those MPAs do vote, then that will force the, the, the Republicans and the Democrats to come more to the middle. So the idea is more moderate candidates. And I agree, the research has been um, not really terribly supporting in that area. I have a, a similar, but a little bit of a different angle uh, on it, um, uh, which is just the first is a caveat. Um, uh, my, ideally, I'm a big fan of ranked choice voting. We're not going to be talking about that. That's not on the Me on too. the ballot. That, 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 that would be ideal. This is not. This is something a little bit different. Um, but my point of departure on this is I think we do have a problem. Um, and the problem in, is that our, our system in the state of Florida and nationwide, um, the vast majority of our state legislative districts and congressional districts are non-competitive uh, at the general election uh, level. And that lack of competitiveness um, actually has, for me, I think a very big impact on the sense of accountability that our elected officials have with respect to all of the people uh, that they represent. And I believe that, that firmly, that you know, I, I believe in competition and when you don't have it, I think the people that are, that are in power really have a very narrow sense of who's keeping them there. And so I think that that's a problem. Um, uh, this system, while it's not ideal, uh, the, the top two system, will certainly introduce uh, a healthy degree of competition in terms of uh, our electoral system at the state legislative district and congressional district uh, level. And I do think uh, even if you don't get different outcomes, uh, you know, folks will behave a little bit differently. I think what's at risk is a party autonomy uh, parties under the system have a more difficult time of controlling who uh, gets in office. Um, and there's no guarantee that you're going to have uh, somebody from your party represented in a general election, which bothers some people, which is why neither the Republican Party or the Democratic Party are in favor of this. Um, and there are some third parties, which I don't quite understand why. Um, if you're not going to get in the top two, you're not, certainly not going to win anything. Um, uh, so, so political parties are not in favor of this. Uh, so it's got a tough slog uh, uh, ahead. But in terms of what's wrong with our electoral system, um, I'm not all that concerned about party autonomy uh, and, and making sure that you have a candidate uh, uh, in, in a general uh, election. I think the risk of that actually is rather uh, minor for the top two parties. I think what this would do is it introduce a healthy degree of competition and really improve accountability in our political system. So that's why I'm in favor of it. Ms. Brigham, the, the league was initially for this, I think, and now you're against it. Is that correct? Yes, we've taken a good hard look at this, uh, several additional hard looks at this, and we've changed our position to uh, we oppose, strongly oppose uh, this initiative. We have not, I have not heard anyone touch on the issue of economic, or excuse me, of um, racial equity. We have systemic racism in the United States. Our government has been structured to favor white Americans. That is the history of this country and that unfortunately still exists today. 
So these long practices would uh, likely result in mainly white candidates who have the money to be favored at the top of these primaries. And would, this would harm the uh, representation in communities of color. The League has a, a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we firmly believe that this could harm those communities of color who don't have enough of a say as it is uh, in our legislature and we or in city councils or county commissions and and we just don't believe that the top two is is the way to go when it comes to the racial disparity issue also you could have a situation i mean talking about you know there's the argument that the top two is going to bring everyone closer together but there could actually be a situation where you have two candidates at the top of the ticket from the same party so I don't see how that brings anyone closer together. That could just bring about more party divide. I, or, and I will say, the league did not base its decision on political parties. We really don't care what the parties think. We care about what the voters think. We are pro-voter, not pro-party. And as far as uh, the comment about uh, this bans NPAs from voting, I just have to add that uh, it's very easy to change your voter registration online and uh if, if you educate yourself you if you want to stay npa most of the time but there's a candidate that you want to vote for on the other side of the issue you can always go on to your supervisor of election website change your party make your vote and then go back to being npa after that it is very easy to do uh, I will say you you can do that. I don't think Floridians should be required to do that to have their voice heard. But you can. No, I think that. you bring up you bring up a really excellent point about communities of color. Um, I, I would acknowledge firmly that the legislative black caucus is is opposed to this uh, for that same argument. We have looked for some academic literature to to bear that out to show where that has happened. And uh, similar to what Adrian said, there's not a whole lot that shows significant outcome impacts. So. Uh, I don't want to say that there is, and I don't want to say that that's proven or disproven. There just isn't a lot of evidence in places like California that have done this, that there's really a lot of impact on the ultimate uh, who gets elected and what color they are, or what party they are. Um, and I think those matter and, th and people should be aware of that. Also, people should be aware that this only affects state elections. So we're talking governor, cabinet and legislative races. So this doesn't affect congressional, doesn't affect your local. These are those, those are those three. But I would say two things to, to, to the group. Uh, one is that we talk about non-competitive elections or two uh, representatives of the same party making it through the top two. Already about a third of the Florida House is elected at the primary. That is, there is no opposition from the other party. And whoever wins the primary, by default, wins the general election. So we're not going to be increasing the uh, disaffection of voters by this. We're gonna be decreasing that because we already see 40 plus races where there is only one candidate, one party's candidates running. And whoever wins the primary wins the general by default. And the second thing is, it is true, both the Republican Party and Democratic Party of Florida are opposed to this, but working many years in the legislature, legislative process and at the uh, congressional level, I would say, Generally, when both parties are opposed to something, we found the right solution. That's how we know that we've found where the people are because both the Republicans and the Democrats are upset with our solution and that's the definition of compromise. So well, I, Robert, I do I, think it's a good thing. Sorry about that. I will say thank you for um, correcting me on that. You're right, it would only affect the legislative and cabinet races and not local races. But I would also say, because I hear a lot of, we hear a lot of uh, those in favor of the top two, comparisons to California, and Florida is a very different state from California. California has many more minorities than Florida. Florida is an unusual state, and we have to take that into account when we're talking about a top two primary. And the league does support open primaries, and we, we do have a position in our, our study and action policy guide on open primaries, and we support them, but we just cannot support this top two, again, because we believe it would, could lead to real racial inequities. Final comments on this one? All right. So we'll go to Amendment 4. This is the, uh, the clearest language, voter approval of constitutional amendments.
It would require all proposed amendments or revisions to the state constitution to be approved by the voters in two elections instead of one in order to take effect. And that way both would have to be 60%. That was the current standard today. The proposal applies the current thresholds for passage of each of the two elections. So um, two times, not just one, but two. Uh, Mr. Weiser, you were the only one on the panel that supports this one. Why do you support it? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's because of what I've been saying here, partially, the um, Constitution has been amended far too many times. It is no longer a framework document. It's an avenue for le legislation. It's an avenue for public policy change. And that's not necessarily a negative thing. We just need to make sure that we do it very carefully. So we're having this good conversation and we have some, uh, some different views represented, but the best way to ensure that what we put in there really belongs in there is to vote it. If people vote yes, then you have a two year window to re-educate voters, to have them consider the actual impacts of what they've done. And then if they say, yes, this was a really good idea, then we absolutely know that that's something that we should put into our foundational document. I don't wanna to throw too many statistics, but just to let you know, Florida's constitution has been amended 140 times since it was adopted in 1968. The US constitution was adopted in 1789 and has been, adopted, has been amended 27 times. Since 1992, we've amended it 50 times, five zero. Since 2006, when we raised the threshold to 60% from 50% plus one, it's been amended 28 times. And in 2018 alone, the last election, it was, there were 12 amendments to the Constitution. We are doing this too much. We need to make sure that we are certain about the things that we put in the Constitution. I'm not saying we should make it harder for people to put things up for consideration. We should just be very careful about how we put things in it. Now, a lot of people say that uh, this would reduce the access of citizens to change their Constitution. The problem with that is that the amendments one through four, which are the citizen initiatives, not five and six, which are put on by the legislature, in total have raised $28.4 million, $28 million to put these on the ballot. Raise your hand if you gave any of that money. I mean, this is already not the citizens at the grassroots getting together and putting things on. These are already moneyed interests that are trying to bypass the republic, the legislative process, where we elect people to have these kind of discussions and do things through law, which is the way that a republic works. And we're trying to say, no, we want to circumvent that, which we've done 140 times. This simply says, okay, that avenue is still open to you, but you better be certain about the thing that you put in there because everyone's going to have two years to rethink what they do. And if they really wanted it, they can do it. But if they think, huh, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, now I understand what the implications that'll be and I don't want to do that, then they have a second chance to say, nope, let's leave the foundational document as a framework of government and not flying with the wind of the will of whatever issue we may want to think about somebody paying $9 million to put advertisements on TV. So Mrs. Brigham, you disagree. Yes, we, the league, completely disagrees. Um, first of all, the reason that the uh, Florida Constitution had to be completely rewritten in 1968 was because uh, just a handful of legislators had the power to put anything in. And when you have that kind of situation where you have this uh, little power this power grabbers within the legislature uh, blocking anything from being put in, that's a problem. So uh, we had to open it up to citizen initiatives. It is very difficult to get a citizen initiative onto the ballot. And I don't think that I'm completely disagreeing with what has been said before. Uh, it is uh, onerous. It takes hundreds of thousands of signatures, millions of dollars, Supreme Court review. But that does not mean that it should be made harder because it is already so difficult. But to ask our citizens to vote twice at the supermajority of 60% to get this, an amendment passed is ludicrous. You might just as well ask someone to summit Mount Everest. <laughs> it would be absolutely impossible for anyone to get an initiative onto the ballot this way, except the richest of the richest, rich, and that would be the billionaires. This is very much a favorite of big money interests that we're very suspicious about the uh, groups 
behind this, the donors behind this. It's a very shadowy, uh, keep our constitution clean. Not much is known about the donors. I think it's been $9 million was that funded this initiative. And when there's a lack of transparency like this, our antenna go up. Others, Dr. Moore, do you have a comment on this? You're against it? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, well, I'm sort of a 50-50 bar on this one, I have to say, um, because Robert's 100% right that we brutalize our state constitution with this process. We've already talked about things that are being done through the constitution uh, that shouldn't be. I think that's come up at least twice, if not more, just this evening. Um, the uh, it's I mean, it's a it's a real problem because that when you put something in the Constitution, you you make it much more difficult to change. Um, and we're putting things in the Constitution that are not evergreen, that are that really are going to need changing as the world changes. Uh, and this is a huge problem. The thing is, is the right way to do that is not necessarily to make everybody have to vote twice. The reason why people are making constitutional changes uh, that shouldn't be is because they can't do legislative ballot initiatives. So the right thing to do is, is to amend our constitution to allow legislative ballot initiatives because Robert also made the good point about we have a republic. Most of the business of government is supposed to be done by the legislature, or arguably all of it, but that has its problems too because we've all lived in a state where often the legislature is not interested in doing things that the people really care about because of the nature of the system. And so ballot initiatives is an effective way to kind of try to balance the Republic virtues of having the legislature make most of the decisions with the people still having a chance to step in and they should have the tool of, of changing the constitution. They should have the tool of passing laws by, by popular vote. And I think if we had that situation, we wouldn't necessarily need to put in such a draconian check on changing the constitution. Do you see any hope of having statutory initiatives though? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, if uh, it, it's, it's all, unfortunately, like Robert said, it's about the money. It's like, who's gonna scrape up the money to create statutory initiatives? Uh, yeah, it's, we have to judge things partly by practical reality and partly by ideals. I think judging it by practical reality, it's gonna be tough to get there, but um, dramatically cutting people, what we're, what we're faced with right now is the practical reality of if we accept this double vote, we accept that we are going to get far, far, far less say directly in all of these important issues. We're gonna to have to really lean on our legislators. And I don't know about you, but I'm not, I, I don't have that much confidence in my representatives. Uh, you know, they're not bad folks, but uh, they haven't been doing a lot of things that I think they should be doing. And I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon either. So, you know, the counter to Carol, your question is, do I think the legislature is gonna suddenly get its act together? No, I don't. <laughs> Maybe yeah, Carol, just a couple of other uh, points. Just um, uh, I would, Chesterfield Smith, a great <laughs> character. He was the chair of the original uh, Constitutional Commission uh, in 1968, not the original, but our last constitution. Uh, uh, and he was pretty clear uh, that this constitution uh, is going to change uh, with the, the times. They saw a rapidly changing state, uh, and that's why they put in more vehicles for change. Uh, and he quote, you can quote him, you know, the, the citizens are the ultimate repository for constitutional change in the state of Florida. So if you care about the original intent of those that put the constitution in place, the fact that we do change the constitution in Florida a lot is by uh, design. Now, I think that, that being said, that the, the change in 2006 um, to a supermajority, so the threshold moving from 50 to 60 percent, actually might have been a good thing, because um, uh, we were probably even more arbitrary and capricious uh, prior to that go change going in. It's a fairly high bar uh, at the moment. I think having a, a, a double pass or having to get something through twice uh, is just a little bit too much in terms of uh, disempowering uh, the citizens in Florida. Keep in mind 
that your electorates in general elections are quite different than those in midterms elections. So if you do in two su su uh, successive cycles, all you need to do to knock something down is to get 40% um, in one year or another when you're going to have different people uh, that, that come out uh, uh, to vote. And so uh, I, 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 I think that's a problem. The other thing is, you know, and, and this is total conjecture. Um, but I tend to trust the citizens of Florida on these ballot initiatives when there's a reasonable amount. I think sometimes when there's too many things on the ballot, they just get freaky and start like, you know, yes or no, all the way up and down the ballot. I think we saw that with the, the you know, the CRC stuff uh, last time. Um, so if you're concerned about too many initiatives being on the ballot, well, guess what? Now you're going to have everything that's um, coming up in a given year, plus everything that just passed. Uh, uh, last year, it's going to put more things on the, the ballot. Uh, all these things considered, I think it's a very bad idea, and I'm going to vote no. Well, like that, we've had a couple of questions from the audience I wanted on, on this amendment, and then we'll go back to the others. Um, the one question is regarding Amendment 4, what would be done during the second two-year wait that couldn't be done prior to the first time it's voted on? Well, I would first say people... Ending? <laughs> yeah, people would have a chance to better educate themselves on it. So those who didn't watch the Village Square panel before it and went in for the first time and saw it for the first time, which I think is many of the millions of voters, um, they would have a chance then to say, okay, well, now I can learn about this, I can educate myself on this, and I can reconsider it. Um, I, I do think that's a, that's a, a valid point, but I do think that two-year intervening window would allow people to uh, have some reflection and have some learning time and uh, I think Frank brings up a good point about it passing twice, but that's a good thing. That's exactly why we have a House and a Senate. 49 of the 50 states in the U.S. Congress, you have to pass a bill twice. It has to pass the House and it has to pass the Senate. So it makes perfect sense that we would do the same thing for constitutional amendments to get into the ballot. And I would say, again, these aren't structural changes we're talking about. These are policy issues. Right now on the Secretary of State's website, there are 23 potentially active citizen initiatives for the 2022 ballot. Uh, the 2020 is already closed. We have these six, but there's going to be 23 that people are trying to get the votes for, for, for 2022. Now, again, a lot of those aren't going to work, but about a half a dozen of them are about the use of marijuana. We have one on free classes for anyone making less than $100,000 a year. We have one that you can't get a red light camera ticket. And there's one that all tolls have to be approved by voters. These are not the kind of things that belong in the Constitution. This is exactly, I think Frank's point about Chesterfield Smith is a good one. And I, I'm, we're not trying to disempower people from making changes here. Uh, we're one of only 18 states that allows the citizen initiative, and we think that's a good thing. We just think that you need to be very careful about what you do. And to the exact question, a two-year reflection period will ensure that voters are certain when this is what they want to put in their foundational document. Well, I'd just like to uh, weigh in, Robert. I, I respectfully disagree with you. Uh, first of all, how are we going to know that those same voters are going to be here in two years? People move in and out of Florida all the time. It seems to us this is just another way to muck up the citizen initiative process, which we've seen our legislature doing over the past several years now whittling away at direct democracy, uh, so much so that this comes along, and once again, who's behind this, we'd really like to know, uh, this comes along and all but closes the coffin shut for, except for the wealthiest of the wealthy. And when you have, and the league is strongly nonpartisan, but when you have one party ruling the legislature and the cabinet for years, there's really no other way for the, the values of those citizens that are not being represented in Tallahassee to have a say other than the citizen initiative process. You know, I have a question I, for the panel. Oh. And that is, uh, are, is it all constitutional amendments, including those that are passed by the legislature, that are referred by the legislature that are here? Or are we only talking about initiatives? Yes, all. Yeah. all. It's now, all. the other state that it's does all. this limits it to only citizens' initiative. Delaware does this, and they, they, they only limit it to some. Um, but no, this one would be all. Um, there is, in other states, that, the other state that has done this, that there have been 14 that have been on the ballot twice that have passed the first time. 12 of those passed the second time. Because when the people want something, Patty, to your point, we don't want to silence the people. When the people want something, they will pass it a second time. 
And I agree with you. We can ensure that everyone, you don't have to prove that you voted on it the first time to vote on it the second time. It's the electorate, not the person. But when you put forth something that the people want, they will vote for it twice. So it's not an additional hurdle. It's just an additional check to make sure that this is what we really want to do before we change the foundational document. And I would love more people to participate in the process to make sure that we have a legislature that's representative of the people, which is why I support Amendment 3. Well, you know, the, here's the thing, though. The idea that people are going to deliberate, you know, for the half year up to the first vote and then for two years until it comes up to vote again is ludicrous. People don't want – people got lives to live. They don't want to think about politics. They don't want to think about these things for two and a half years, and they're not going to. You know who's going to think about it and write about it and talk about it endlessly for two and a half years? All the special interests and nerds like us. Uh, so we the, – the policy nerds of the state and everybody who's got skin in the game are going to be all over it for the same. The average citizen is going to check out completely – until the election comes around again, they're going to say, oh, remind me what that was again. It's that's unless you're a professional politician or a policy nerd like us, you're not going to think about that uh, that much. So it's not going to work that way. Uh, what it is, is it's just going to make it slower and harder. So if all you want is fewer initiatives getting into the Constitution, this will probably do that. But it doesn't mean you're going to get better ones. Uh, or better participation by any stretch. No, and you know what else um, I'd like to add, uh, Adrian, is that really, and we're not calling this Amendment 4, by the way, we're calling this Number 4. And why? Because two years ago, Amendment 4, the uh, restoration of voting rights for ex-felons passed. And this is a very unfortunately numbered am amendment because almost 65% of voters in Florida passed Amendment Four. Number four, however, is an insult to voters because the, the implication is we're not smart enough to vote on this first time and get it right. You have to vote again. We just want to make sure that you're, you got this right. And that's insulting to the voters. I don't think it's insulting. I think it's checks and balances, which is exactly what our republic has, has done wonderfully. To pass a law, you have to have the House pass it, the Senate pass it, and the governor sign it. So I don't think it's unreasonable that we say that people should vote on an amendment twice. Not saying you can't vote, just saying you get a chance to vote on it twice. And Adrian, I don't expect anybody to spend 800 days straight considering it. But to, to take tw time twice in the voting booth to consider it, I also don't think that's too much to ask. One quick observation. Had this been in place a few years ago, this year we would have to like face that monstrosity of a ballot because the voters just passed all of those things with the CRC. We have to do it all over again on top of the things that we were doing now. Uh, dear Lord, that would be horrible. I wonder if people would rethink their vaping votes. And, this session would be six hours long. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's another interesting point. If the people put forth that they wanted something like a vaping ban, uh, as they did in 2018, then maybe the legislature would take it up and actually pass a law and put, put these policy issues where they belong in statute. Uh, rather than have it come back to the ballot a second time. And we could say, hey, the people expressed their will. The legislature solved that problem through statute. Now we don't have to come back and vote on it again as a constitutional amendment because we already addressed it, because the voters expressed their will. So I think that would be a, a positive but mildly unintended consequence. Just, it's just a technical question. Um, if um, something, if this were to pass, and then under this new amendment, um, uh, uh, the voters passed uh, a, a change to the Constitution, and then the legislature passed policy that spoke uh, to what the voters just passed, it still comes up again on the ballot, doesn't it? I don't think you can negate it through legislative action. That's true. But yeah. um, it, would, it could spur the legislature to action uh, separate from it having to be in the Constitution. If the legislature and, then a, and then if voters passed it, we'd be all confused because we'd have the constitutional <laughs> change. And the you know, that you, you raise a good point. That has happened a few times in states that have this set up. Um, and, and what I've seen happen is that uh, the, when the legislature addresses it and then the campaign on behalf of the, um, the ballot, uh, the, the constitutional change, withdraws uh, their support. So now there's no longer a campaign for it. And in fact, they sort of officially say, we no longer need this. And that usually works to kill it um, for what that's worth. It's still on the ballot though. So you could 
get some messiness, but uh, maybe a mechanism to, uh, to allow the proponents to withdraw uh, the amendment, even if it has been up for vote, vote once would make sense. That may even be in the rules. I don't know. I haven't looked at that part of the language. There's another thing to consider here as well. Since 1968, 80% of the ballot initiatives or the amendments that made it to the ballot were placed there by the legislature uh, or the appointees on the Constitution Revision Commission. So uh, those amendments are coming mainly from the legislature or the CRC and uh, the, the citizens initiatives are in the minority. So we would actually see a longer ballot and that is another example of why. Uh, okay, great. Um, I was, uh, I'm sorry, this, Robert, let's, let's, let's move on. I've got a question from the audience on Amendment 3. Remember Amendment 3 is the minimum wage. <laughs> what about healthcare workers? Aren't many of them being paid minimum wage? Minimum wage is number two. Number two. I'm right. sorry, number two. It says number three, but yeah, number two. What about healthcare workers? Aren't many of them paid minimum wage? I don't know that any licensed uh, healthcare workers are paid minimum wage. In fact, I'm about 98% sure that's a no. There are people hired in nursing homes and, and, and uh, 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 other uh, healthcare facilities that provide, uh, you know, non-licensed uh, uh, support services and, and work who might be making a minimum wage, but you know, you've got people in the front office and, and various things like that, but not, uh, not medical professionals. Well, the support st uh, staff, you know, you, you have the supporting uh, workers in healthcare facilities or hospitals, and they're certainly not making a lot of money. And I would, I don't have the data on this, but I would wager that the, um, the janitorial crew who keeps the hospitals clean and the aides who empty uh, the unpleasantries of the jars left outside of the, uh, hos the uh, hospital rooms are not making a living wage. And uh, it, they're, they're taking these jobs because they, they are not uh, for skilled workers and because they need the money. And they're often working more than one job to feed themselves or their family. So I think that's an excellent um, industry, or I hate to call it healthcare an industry, but it sort of is these days, but that's an excellent um, example is that our healthcare system. So I also think it's an excellent example, but to me, I, I think it's a, it's a good point. It's a lot of workers, especially in our state where we have uh, a disproportionate number of, uh, of senior citizens and, and, and those maybe accessing health services and, and not, as Adrian pointed out, the licensed health services, but as Patty pointed out, um, healthcare assistants and a variety of other people in that industry. Um, when we looked at the five major industries that would be affected, uh, healthcare was not one of them because of the percentage of people within that larger industry category, that uh, NICS code, which is how we um, economists classify different uh, employment sectors. But I think it brings up a really good point about why this is so dangerous in the Constitution, because a significant amount of healthcare is paid for by Medicare and Medicaid which is public dollars. So if we raise the, the cost of that, who is going to bear the burden of that? So is the federal government gonna all of a sudden start paying more in Medicare reimbursement to hospitals because hospitals pay their janitorial staff more? Well, no, because the US Constitution forbids state law from applying to federal government. So we're gonna basically squeeze out people. They're gonna lose their jobs because the hospital is getting the exact same reimbursement for the service that they are today, but they have to pay some employees more. The only way to make ends meet is to have some people lose their jobs. So that's exactly where I say the road to hell is paved with good intentions and exactly why this is such a dangerous policy to put in the, the constitution, because as we address little issues like that with Medicare reimbursement rates, which the legislature has no control over, because it's a federal program, how are we going to go back and fix that if we realize a problem that we've created in one, two or three years when we have to go back and change the constitution. One more question, and this is, is on amendment three. Why are the taxpayers funding private party races? Wouldn't it be better for those parties to have private election processes? Yes. That would be a big change. That'd yeah, I love big. that point that Adrian talked about their private organizations and Patty talked about that you can change your, your um, 
your affiliation to them. And those are both accurate, but we are still paying for it as taxpayers. So, you know, the idea that you can go into a primary and vote on the local election or for a judicial retention election, most of the major issues on the ballot are who's the primary for governor, for the cabinet, for your state legislator. Those are the big issues. Those are literally the first ones on the ballot. And we're saying that 3.7 million people who choose not to be a member of this club, I acknowledge they could choose to be, still have to pay for it. So Adrian, you say you could choose to be a member or choose not to be. You choose not to be a member of a great organization like the League of Women Voters, which I think is <laughs> wonderful. Or you choose not to be a member of an organization like Tax Watch or the Village Square, but you're not paying for it with tax dollars. And you are paying for the, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party to choose their representatives. And that's not fair. Well, let's just stop doing it. I mean, look, the entire global finance system moves all the wealth and transactions of the world online. The GOP and the Democratic Party can do an online election process completely secure that won't even be that expensive. They have more than enough money to do it and just take this whole primary business right out of our, our public taxpayer funded elections designed to decide democratic issues and let the party stuff do its things and then they can put whatever candidates for they want. It's not even required by law that the parties use the elections to pick their candidates. They can just pick. They can just pick and say, this is our candidate. We decided in our smoke filled room. Um, it only happens this way because of tradition and because back when we started these partisan primary elections, we were a smaller country and it didn't seem like a big deal. Now it's kind of a big deal and it's actually messing up our democracy. So let's yank it out. Not such a bad idea, Adrian. And then we can put ranked choice voting in in the general election. And and exactly, yeah. And by this group is so narrowly focused on these, <laughs> in those particular proposals rather than these broad, uh, we agree that the uh, should be legislative initiatives and doing something about political parties. We have just a few minutes left because we promised everyone we would be done for plenty of time to them to get ready for the debate. Um, but I want to give everybody an opportunity to just say any, have any final words about the ballot measure measures as a whole um, or about voting or about anything uh, you wish to sort of conclude with briefly. So Patty, do you want to start? Ms. Bingham, Bingham, do you want to start? Yes, I would. I was trying to unmute my microphone. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Well, we certainly uh, know that many of your attendees on Zoom uh, are uh, those regular voters on our, hopefully on Facebook that are watching us. but. It's so critical this year, it, and I'd just like to put a plug in for early voting. Uh, we want you to vote, and these amendments are listed on our vote411.org uh, online uh, uh, voter guide, and we're also going to be putting out paper voter guides around the state. But it is critical this year to vote early. We know that there's a slowdown at the Postal Service. We know that we're expecting record numbers of voters to pa uh, cast their ballots early via mail. If you have not gotten your ballot into the mail by October the 13th, please go to a secure drop box and put it in that or go inside or a mask and vote early. We cannot afford to uh, have ballots piling up uh, and not meeting the 7 p.m. election day deadline to be counted because of a slowdown with the U.S. Postal Service. So please, if you're voting by mail, vote by October 13th by mail. And then once you do, you can track your ballot on your Supervisor of Elections website. You can see when it's been um, received and your vote has been counted. But remember, your vote is your voice. It's your most powerful uh, way that you can um, participate in our democracy. Thank you. Dr. Moore, final words? Thank you. Yeah, I would just say, you know, uh, a, I hear from a lot of people that the thing they don't like about ballot initiatives is that they're complicated and hard to sort of sort through on their plain language and and that people don't feel entirely satisfied with the sort of he said she said pro and con arguments either because they feel like both sides are sort of not telling the whole truth and uh and and so that they're just uncomfortable with the whole thing and 
And I just encourage people that think one of the great things about <laughs> the internet these days is with a pretty simple Google search, you can find a lot of nobody's, they don't have a dog in the hunt, fairly simple explanations of what these initiatives really do. And I encourage to do that and make your decision based on that. Um, uh, it, it, most of them can be explained pretty simply and you'll probably know what you think about it once you see that. Some are a little more fraught. I think definitely the minimum wage one, even when you understand what it does still, there's a lot of trade-offs, but a lot of them are for, fairly straightforward. So, you know, seek out that sort of plain English explanation and, uh, and, and, and base, base your decision on that because the whole uh, arguing matches that go on don't really help you get any clarity. Terrific. Mr. Weissert. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to the great panelists, to the Village Fair for putting this on and to the moderator, although I will object to uh, people being introduced in alphabetical order. As a fellow Weissert, I would think that we don't like <laughs> alphabetical order. I know it's always unfair to me. Um, I'll, I'll sort of repeat what Adrian said, that, that the Tax Watch Voter Guide is available at floridataxwatch.org. We are a 501c3, so everything we do is publicly available and free to everyone. Uh, it's 35 pages of analysis on these issues and six, six sentences of recommendation. So you can get a ton of information, the pro, the con, we lay out what the opponents say, what the proponents say, what the summary is, what the full text is, and what the evidence shows. Uh, so whatever, agree with us, don't agree with us, totally fine, but educate yourself and you can do that at floridataxwatch.org. I know the League of Women Voters puts out a great voter guide as well. Uh, Reason always has great information and the universities do. So. Uh, I strongly su support both of my two colleagues and say, educate yourself and vote. Very good. Dr. Alcock, last word. Thank you. So I just would like uh, to thank the Village Square uh, for inviting me uh, here tonight. Uh, it was uh, a, a great panel. I thank my fellow uh, panelists. It's a privilege to be um, on or involved in the event. Uh, I would just come back to um, just ask viewers to take a moment to understand that we are privileged as citizens in the state of, of Florida. Uh, because uh, we we can change uh, the Constitution in ways here that it's just a lot more difficult um, in other states. And with that privilege um, comes a responsibility. Uh, and I know it can be very, very annoying and it can be very, very confusing. And politics does not stop um, on the ballot. And, and so uh, there's lots that is, is going on. But uh, that, that responsibility, I think, is important for the citizens of Florida. And so I, one of the, my rules of thumb was if every Floridian spent one hour, just one hour, um, uh, trying to understand what was on the ballot in terms of uh, changes uh, uh, to, to the state constitution, I would have a great degree of trust. I kind of trust Floridians to begin with, but if all of them would just devote one hour, and I, and I think my, my, my colleagues here have, have told you a number of, of different outlets to do some some really good work um, uh, across the board. They're represented here. They might have some different angles and different opinions, uh, but there are, there are resources out there if you take the time to devote an hour. You don't have to devote a weekend or anything like that. Um, uh, but I think, uh, and if you're here watching right now still and you haven't left, uh, that's your hour and a half. So you're in my really good book. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, and, and again, I think uh, events like this are really, really helpful for the voters. Yes, Florida matters. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you to Village Square. Thank you to, your, to our audience. Uh, vote and educate yourself. And uh, have a wonderful evening. And we'll all I'll be in front of the TV watching the debate. Good evening. Thank you so much.